Good morning, everyone. You're joining the Technical Oversight Committee meeting, and I want to give just a couple of moments to make sure all our uh, public participants have a chance to get dialed in here, so we'll get started shortly. <clears throat> Alrighty, why don't we get started? I'm Julie LaRock with the South Florida Water Management District, and you've joined the quarterly meeting of the Everglades Technical Oversight Committee. Uh, if it's all right with everyone, I'm just going to read a list of names off my screen here. These are folks who are either TOC reps or uh, otherwise dialing in so they can participate in the meeting. If you are a public attendee, I'm not going to read your name. <laughs> So sorry about that. It's a little hard to keep up with that particular list. Um, we are only holding this meeting today online using Zoom, and we will continue to keep everyone posted on future quarterly meetings and how we'll be handling those. Uh, currently uh, on the meeting, we have Special Master John Barquette, and we have TOC representatives, um, let me go down the list here, Dan Crawford from the Corps, Donato Surratt from the uh, park, representing the park. We've got Lori Miller representing the refuge, myself, and Frank Powell representing DEP. And we have a handful of other folks who are going to be presenting or possibly engaging in uh, the meeting today, so I wanted to let you know they are also here. Alyssa Gilhooley, Chris King, Ed Smith, Jed Redwine, uh, Julia LaMonico, Stuart Van Horn, uh, Susan Kruger, our uh, court reporter, uh, dutifully typing down everything we say, and Troy Hill, as well as Violetta Chuka, who uh, really does a great job coordinating meetings for us. So uh, that's who we've got on the line, so to speak. Uh, for those of you who are either somebody I just mentioned or you're a public attendee, I did want to remind you about uh, how to operate with Zoom. It can change from time to time. Uh, please mute your speakers or whatever device you are using if you're not talking, uh, maybe if you're going to talk through the phone and you have a computer on also, you'll want to make it so that you can only hear to one of those. You want to listen from one source. Uh, if you would like to speak during the meeting, and this includes the folks doing public comments, please use the raise hand feature. Uh, my raise hand feature looked a little bit different to me this morning, so yours may look different than a previous meeting also, depending on the um, uh, software that you're using. Uh, if you are using a phone, you can uh, unmute by pressing star six. And oh, I forgot to mention, if you press star nine on your phone, that also will raise your hand. Um, you can mute and unmute by pressing star six. Uh, I'm not really seeing anything for us to vote on today, but if we were going to vote, we would get some public comment beforehand. Uh, any other comments on the agenda, general comments, and so forth, we will take at the end of the meeting, so hang in there with us. Um, because we're meeting online here with Zoom, we're not going to be able to take any written public comment. Uh, you guys will have an opportunity to make your comments uh, at the end of the meeting, and we will uh, take notes and record those so that if need be, we could get back to you. Uh, public comments, you're going to raise your hand. Uh, if you have the chat feature, which I think we disabled, but if you do, please uh, use that only if you have technical difficulties. We're not going to be able to incorporate chat in these public meetings. Uh, and for the reps, uh, just a reminder, 
if we forget or miss an action item, we will try to recap those at the end of the meeting. Uh, one of the things I kind of like doing from home here <laughs> uh, is I get to actually look at the web page uh, when I describe the various things that we have posted on the website. So that's kind of nice. Uh, so I did want to let you know on our main web page there are a number of documents posted. There is some instructional material for participating in the Zoom meeting. And the final agenda is also posted here on the main web page. Uh, there's a link there for read-aheads, and I'll go over those in a moment. Uh, but posted on the main page, we see the compliance tables that uh, our folks put out. So these are monthly tracking, uh, and we've got the refuge from 2007 up through the third quarter of 2020, uh, provisional Shark River Slough tracking, uh, Taylor Slough and Coastal Basins tracking. So those are all posted there. and. In addition, there's some reports for which, uh, which feed into the slides that you'll be seeing today. So there's the third quarter settlement agreement report that covers the third calendar quarter of 2020. And there's two related files there, the quality assessment report and there's a data file that actually gives you all the data in an Excel spreadsheet format. So that's all on the main page. And then under the read aheads for the meeting today, uh, there are several items in addition to another link to the agenda. There's the draft notes from the October meeting. There is a memo that we discussed at the last meeting uh, that's posted up there. So this is a memo from the principals to the reps. Uh, and that was synopsized in the meeting notes. The content is, is there. Uh, there's the settlement agreement report presentation that John Madden will be giving, and there's updates on a couple of things we discussed at the last meeting. One is the S333 North structure and a little more detail on, on the equations, and John will present that. And then there's also an update on the SEP South monitoring that Ken Bradshaw will be presenting. So all of that is uh, on the... <laughs> Uh, on the agenda or on the website for us. Okay. Wow, that's like all my notes I have too. That's great. All right, good deal. Uh, anything, anybody need to make any changes to the agenda at this point? Julie, this is John, this is John Barquette. Were, do, were you planning to discuss the memo from the principals? Um, I wasn't necessarily, but as we go through the meeting notes, you know, there's an action item there, and I did actually review the memo versus what we put in the meeting notes, so um, we could certainly do that if we desire. Well, at whatever is the appropriate time, I just want to make an observation about it. Okay, great. Thank you. All right. um, so maybe when we do the meeting notes and, and go over the action item from the last meeting, that's kind of when I was figuring we would do any sort of discussion we need to on the memo. So uh, anything else on the agenda? I'm not seeing or hearing anything. All right. Uh, our next item on the agenda is actually to approve the meeting summary. And I'm going to confess I didn't print a copy of the meeting summary. I have one on my drive here that uh, I could probably show myself, but I'm not going to. Uh, so as we just mentioned, there was one action item out of the last meeting, and it had to do with a memo that the uh, principals had drafted, I guess, at that point and, and were circulating. And so we did agree to post that. We did that, um, and I can kind of go over that in a second here. Did anybody have any changes or anything else on the meeting notes that you wanted us to address? Hey, Julie, this is Frank from DEP. Um, I don't have any comments on the meeting notes. It's my understanding that the, all the principals signed that memo that you referenced uh, as of yesterday. Is that is that everyone's understanding? That's correct. And we did manage to get that posted. Uh, it, it got posted on the web page this morning, right before the meeting. So the version that's out there actually has all the signatures on it. Okay, excellent. Thank you, ma'am. Uh, like I said, I don't have any comments on the meeting, on the meeting notes. 
Okay, great. Thank you. Do any of the other reps have comments on the notes themselves, the meeting notes? This is Lori with Fish and Wildlife Service. Um, negative, Julie. Oh, thank you, Lori. Yeah, Julie, this is Dan Crawford. I also have no comments on the meeting notes. This is Donato. Okay, Donato, I guess it's up to you to speak up. <laughs> I have no comments on the, mem the meeting notes and I motion to accept them as they stand. Okay. And I'll second uh, Donato's motion. Great, thank you all very, very much. Um, there's been a lot of interest in this memo and I'm looking at a hard copy over here. Uh, my cat is not helping me. Uh, I can run through that really quickly for you all. It's a relatively short memo. It has been signed by uh, each and every one of the principals. And uh, basically, I'll, I guess I'll just read through it for you all. It is posted on the webpage, so hopefully uh, you folks can see it. But uh, basically, it says during the month of September 2020, the principals convened to discuss matters related to various topics with specific emphasis to seek resolution on water quality matters and to provide senior leadership updates on, a, on a, other important, important topics. During the meeting, all of the undersigned principals agreed to providing the following guidance to their TOC representatives. If you're reading the memo, there's a couple of typos that I'm not giving you. <laughs> Uh, the TOC members and their principals acknowledge and agree that 2019 Shark River flu exceedance was caused by a localized phenomena of phosphorus release and transport related to patterns of stage and flow and less related to phosphorus coming from the EAA. The principals agree this localized phenomenon should be thoroughly researched with the intent of identifying the underlying cause and adequate solutions to it the principals have met and committed their agencies to work together for this purpose. The principals have designated appropriate staff from each agency to carry out the research and scope of work agreed to by the agencies on an accelerated basis. The principals will appropriately direct this effort outside of the TOC forum and will work together to form a cohesive solution through the experts at each agency. The principals and their agencies are dedicated to cooperatively delivering healthy water quality and quantity to the Shark River Slew in the entire Everglades ecosystem. The final results of these activities and any agreed upon remedies will be made available to the public as well as TOC members. So that's the content of the memo. And as we discussed last meeting, and I will reiterate today, uh, I can tell you for a fact the group has been meeting, um, I think, weekly or every other week. And I, the last, my last understanding is they're going to have some materials to present uh, to agency leaders here in the relatively near future. Um, so hopefully that covers the memo for everybody. So, so this is John Barquetta. Your last comment actually speaks to the observation I was going to make, which was there's there's really no schedule, there's no timing, there's no uh, uh, what's the right word uh, transparency with respect to who's involved, how often they're meeting, when when you might expect something. Um, you could read the memo literally in two or three years from now, you might hear from people. I, it doesn't sound like that's the case based on what you just said, but I think, I think you need to have uh, some sort of mechanism uh, to, from a consent decree standpoint, some sort of mechanism to indicate that in fact you're monitoring progress and you're re at least reporting periodically on how often people are meeting, when you expect deliverables, that sort of thing, because you are an oversight committee and I can't quite tell what you're overseeing based on the principal's memo. Sure, I understand that. And, um, you know, when we're ready to roll things out here at the TOC or other forums, we'll do that. Um, I will share with you and the others that three of the five TOC reps are part of this working group and would uh, be somewhat familiar with uh, how things are progressing. So um, 
I have no I have no doubt that all of this is proceeding apace. I'm not really concerned so much about that that um, that that's not the case. I'm concerned that people don't know that that's the case. Got it. Well, we can we'll talk about that and see how how we might ensure folks know that things are happening. Very good. That, that's what I uh, would hope you would do. And, and maybe you can just build in a, a feature uh, for the next meeting to make sure there's an update. And I assume there'll probably be some sort of a read ahead before the next meeting with an update as well. We will uh, discuss with our agency leaders about doing that. Okay, thank you. All Julie? right. Yeah. Well, just, 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 just let me just emphasize the point. You, you are dealing with a consent decree, a federal court obligation. So you just want to make sure that you're responsive. That's all. That's the point. You want to Understood. make sure you're responsive and people know that you're being responsive. Understood. Understood completely. Thank you. Right. Uh, I need I need all your lawyerly people to keep me straight here. <laughs> Well, I, I actually, I never worry about you. I know that you're you're uh, able to stay straight. I just want to make sure that the public knows that that's what's going on. Uh, yeah, absolutely. I yeah, definitely. And I certainly would also want to reassure the public that something is definitely happening in the background here. So, <laughs> thank you. Okay, Julie, Julie this is Bill yes. Walker. I see uh, you are unmuted, sir. What's up? Yeah, I just had a question on that memo with respect to the exceedance. So was the conclusion that the exceedance was not due to an error or extraordinary natural phenomenon, bring it back to the language of the consent decree? You are correct, sir. And that's reflected in some of the meeting notes from the last couple of meetings, or maybe not the last meeting, but the one prior to that, yes. Okay, so it's not in that category. In other words, it's a real exceedance. It's just that you're invest, you want to investigate what the causes are in more detail. Well, and, and the point of investigating the causes in more detail down there, especially is uh, there are a number of things people have thought about doing to solve the problem. And uh, the engineer and me personally says, gee, I need more information in order to even decide if any of these options is something that's doable. So this working right. group is looking at all of that, yes. Okay, thank you, that's that's good, thank you. You're welcome. Okay, uh, on to our next agenda item, which is the third quarter settlement agreement report. So I will mute myself and turn the mic over to John Madden. Thank you, Julie. Confirm you can hear me loud and clear. Yes, sir. All right. Taking control right now. Let's see. Okay. As Julie mentioned, there are numerous documents posted online uh, that feed into this this report and I'm presenting a summary of the report that updates data through September of 2020. Um, it's considered the third quarter of 2020 report. Uh, September 2020 represents the end of the federal water year by which we measure Shark River Slough and Taylor Slough Coastal Basins inflows to Everglades National Park. Um, and at this point in time, the Shark River Slough results are provisional. We still have provisional flow data that's going to be finalized by the USGS by April. And so we'll re report out on the final results next meeting. Taylor Slough Coastal Basins. 12 month results uh, for the water year 2020 presented herein are the final results. And we have monthly results through September uh, for the refuge. And here's a summary of those. On this sheet, we show at the top 
Uh, again, these are just the single months and the results of the actual collected data, geomean concentrations are in this first, this column here for July, August, and September. And the long-term level associated with the stage uh, is next to those. We can see uh, the long-term levels as the stages go up, the long-term level goes down. So this is the, the value in parts per billion that we're expected to meet. Uh, geo means slightly went in the opposite direction during this period as the water levels went up. Um, we had a slight rise up to 7.8, which did exceed in September, the long-term level of 7.2. That was at a stage of 17.19, which um, we are kind of maxed out at our stage for that equation. So as low as the long-term level is gonna go is 7.2 for any individual month. And we did get 14 samples that month. And I will go into a little more detail on that in a minute. For Shark River Slough, again, provisional results for the 12 month periods ending July, August, and September, the associated flows. These flows result in long-term limits shown here that varied from 9.6 down to 9.4. Our flow aid mean concentrations that were measured for those 12 months periods uh, varied from 9.6 down to 9.3. So right now on a provisional basis, uh, it looks like we are okay. And our measured flow aid mean concentration for water year 2020 uh, at this point is below our long-term limit. And we did meet the guideline of how many events, what percentage of events were greater than 10 parts per billion. We had 35% where our guideline um, in this case was 49%. The final results for Taylor Slough Coastal Basins inflows to Everglades National Park for the 12 month periods ending July, August, and September uh, are shown with the constant long-term limit of 11. And we had a very constant flow in mean concentration over this period of 5.3, well below that. The 2.1% observed events greater than 10 part per billion uh, represents a single event. And I'll point that out a little later. So we're gonna start with the refuge, which uh, we know in September, the, the geometric mean of those 14 stations was about 0.8 parts per billion, a little less than a part per billion above the long-term level computed by the stage. So over this entire 36 month period, it's the, the second occurrence. We almost had a, a, a full 36 months without a red dot on it, but we didn't quite make it. So here, the shading in the background, these stepwise, this is the stage. Um, over the three stations that we measure on the, the days we go out and sample. And we can see that as that stage increased from April through September, the long-term level associated with that calculation uh, decreased and the end point here being the, the 7.2. Uh, the measured geo means were kind of hovering around within a, a, a band here um, didn't really increase dramatically, but again, uh, in the end, had that exceedance in September. And of course, to remind you, it takes two, sorry, we had an excursion in September. It takes two excursions within a 12 month period to be considered an exceedance. So we do not have an exceedance, but you know, we, we still have uh, one excursion on the books here that, um, we're gonna keep an eye on. The 36 month average geo mean for this period was 6.8 parts per billion, which is just below the consent decrees long-term uh, goal of seven parts per billion. And the long-term level for reference, the average of this red line, the points that the red line defines was 9.8 over that 36 months.
checking my notes, make sure I didn't miss anything. Okay. Um, this is essentially the same data, but we took that red long-term level line that was going up and down. We stretch it out at zero and we say, this is how far above or below those measured points are of this zero line, this long-term level line. So we, this one is right on it. Um, and, and these two are 0.6 parts per billion above and 0.8 parts per billion above. And over this entire period uh, works out to 2.9 parts per billion below the long-term level. Now the good news is uh, I showed you these three points for July, August, and September. And as we progressed October through January, we have a preliminary outlook of geometric means that were measured uh, ranging from 6.4 down to 4.6 in the most recent measurement. And our water levels stayed up. So our long-term level um, remained at 7.2 and we were able to, to measure at all 14 stations. Now 4.6 is the lowest uh, Geomean we've had since January of 2018, yes, when there was a 4.5. So, uh, but we do see, see our lowest levels, our lowest phosphorus levels typically in January or December, January, February each year. Last year, I think it was, uh, let me see, it was 4.8 last January. So moving on to Shark River Slough, again, provisional results, and th these will be finalized, should be by the next meeting, next quarterly meeting uh, after USGS produces the, the final flow data for the S12s. We are, as a reminder, using the method 1.5, although I'm just gonna go forward and say it's the method. This was adopted uh, in August by the TOC. So we look at the 12 month periods ending July, August, September. Um, and, and we are at 9.3 with the provisional flow data uh, measured versus the 9.4 goal here. I'm gonna show a little more detail how over time that's progressed. We um, have the long-term record here. We know, uh, 2008 we had data error in 2012 and 14 we had exceedances um, and then 2019 is our most recent um, sorry 2017 and 2019 our most recent exceedances okay looking at the last 36 months, which in this case is three water years, starting October 17th through September 2020. Uh, the, the structures that flow to Shark River Slough, their flow values are, are stacked here. Obviously we had some high flows starting in October, but we can see the seasonal pattern and the S356 pump stations um, that initiated in 2018. We had a little bit of this green area. It is, was temporary pumping going on at the S355A structures from conservation area 3B. Um, and dry season flows mostly through 333. The slide breaks those down in the individual structures. Um, for the S12s, it was October 1st of 2019 that flow stopped, that these structures were closed for S12 A and B. And then for those structures, it was July 22nd and July 15th that those were reopened this last uh, wet season. S12 C, and D were closed on October 29th, 2019. 
and reopen June 2nd and 3rd. The scale is a little bit different here, a little higher on S12D. So there was actually higher flow than maybe initially looks at, at S12D as that's used preferentially. The next set of structures go into the L29 canal east of 333. So we can see uh, 333 dominates flow in this area. The details that were added as of last quarter for incorporating the portion of S356 pumping that is sourced through S335 and considered from the WCAs and counted towards the long-term limit and flow a mean calculation for the Shark River Slough inflows is highlighted in yellow. So if 335 uh, structure is flowing but 356 is not, that means that water is going down to salt date. It's not, not coming into the headwaters of Shark River Slough. But when that 356 pump station kicks on and that water is available from upstream, all that the volume common to both is incorporated. So we can see when 356 is pumping at its capacity, um, it can take pretty much all of the water that 335 passes. There are some times um, when 356 is pumping and no water is coming from 335 and the converse also occurs. I guess I can point out that, um, you know, about 50% of the flow for the water year came, 49% well, came through the S12s and the remaining went uh, in the Northeast Shark River Slough from the L29. This plot shows the, all those flows from the L29 into Northeast Shark River Slough. Uh, the various inflow structures are stacked on top of each other here. And then the outflow structure 334, uh, which basically takes water that would otherwise go in a sharp Northeast Shark River Slough, but moves it instead down to South Dade uh, is this orange line. So anything below the orange line is actually not counted towards the Shark River Slough compliance. So for this water year, we can see there's a little flow remaining at the end of the water year, and then quickly went into a mode where all the water coming through 333 was conveyed to South Dade. And then at a point in time, um, in May, 2020, the 334 was shut and all those flows from through 333, 356, um, all were sent to Northeast Shark River Slough. So for water year 2020 overall, 17% of the flow at 333 ended up going through 334. That's represented by this volume and the remainder went to Northeast Shark River Slough. Incorporating the water quality data uh, again, we had the historic method is shown in yellow here with these vertical bars representing flow on days of the biweekly compliance collection and the dots representing the flow aid mean concentration for those sampling events across our inflow structures. Uh, there is an overlap period as you know, we use a 12 month rolling uh, average. So we're tracking both for a period of time. And then we are now using method 1.5. Uh, again, to remind you, our provisional results, we are just 0.1 part per billion below that limit. Uh, there was a little bit of inflow at in no, November, October and November. Uh, there are a few events where that counted towards this water year's compliance and then very little flow um, went into Northeast Shark River Slope because most of this again was passed toward 334 and South Dade. 
And then the flow started back up. We had three events here. Um, the dates on these are May 8th, May 22nd, and July 6th. And the flow mean concentrations were 16, 11, and 16. I think the highest concentration we saw at 333 was 19 part per billion on this uh, July 6th date here. So that influenced the third quarter results, but and also the water year a bit, but we can see soon after those concentrations declined from 10 down to seven part per billion at the end of the water year. And the effect of these individual circles, which are the, the sampling events on the 12 month moving average flow aid mean um, can be seen here. And in the end, we're at our uh, nine point, I'm gonna have to look back, 9.2 or 9.3? 9 .3. 9.3 observed versus our 9.4 limit. So again, that's all for Shark River Slough provisional results that will again be finalizing next meeting. Finally, Taylor Slough Coastal Basins, which is the final results for this area. Um, total flow is given for reference, but it, it compliance does not rely on that value. We're looking at these 5.3 values versus a long-term limit of 11. Uh, only one sampling event was greater than 10 part per billion. You can see the history of uh, since, you know, at least 2000 lower, much lower than the, that long-term limit. Uh, this is the current water year, 2020. And we have three major inflow points, the G737, the S18C, and the S332D. Um, and you can see the relationship of how much flow is coming from each there. Um, I'm gonna get a little more detail of that, but I guess 332D represented 55% for this latest water year of the flows came into the that detention area through 332T. So the individual structures are shown here. Um, 737's downstream from the S200 pump station. The 332D flow then subsequently can go through 328, which does go into Everglades National Park, Taylor Slough, 332DX1, which goes into a different detention area. Uh, I'm gonna detail that on this slide. So you can see the, the portion in blue and green are both counted towards our flow amine concentrations. It's just a different concentration is associated at with any flows that go out through 328. The remainder through 332D um, can exit through berm three and go over the weir or, or through seepage. So introducing these concentrations, we again adopted the method three sampling um, in August. So we're tracking, these are weekly samples. That's why it's more dense, um, but the flow is in the vertical bars and the concentrations are in the dots. We had back in 2018, um, tropical storm Gordon came through September 4th, 2018. And this period here, we had a major flows and uh, a higher concentration of 12.4 was the flow aid mean here, associated with May 26, 2020 sampling event, which was more of a weekend. Um, that system later formed in a tropical storm Bertha. And 
we did get a two day rainfall of about 14 inches, which was the heaviest since Irma. Um, there was considerable flooding down in, in the Miami area. But as far as water quality, um, there was enough flow to balance that out with lower concentrations resulting in our final, um, at the end of the 12 months, September 2020, water year 2020 being at 5.3 overall. And I believe that's all I have for my presentation. Open it up to any questions. John, this is Donato. Can you go back to slide 16? <laughs> So on this slide, I, I think you said that these three features are the ones that flow the most, and that's why they're on this slide. What is, so when I look at S328, it seems to be slightly higher than what's going through the G737. Can you explain to me again what the logic was for the structures on this slide? The, yeah, we could look at uh, 332D yeah, we could add 328 to this slide, but it would be a portion of the 332D flows. So this does constitute the total into, um, into Taylor Slough Coastal Basins. A portion of this 332D would be 328. Would it make more sense if we included 328 on this slide as well, but it wouldn't be stacked. It would be, yeah, it would be in front of this 332D. I think we can do that. Okay, it was just the logic I was trying to understand. Thanks. Yeah. Any other comments or questions for John on this uh, particular presentation, folks? Hey, Julie, this is Lori with The Refuge. Um, just a real quick question, if I may. You go for it. <laughs> hey, John, can you go back to slide three, please? Sure. Yeah, that one right there. Um, <clears throat> you know, I think, first of all, it's really important to point out that we have been in high water conditions uh, throughout the Everglades ecosystem this year and somewhat, uh, you know, almost in a flood control uh, situation. So I just wanted to let everybody know that the refuge did work very closely with water managers and, you know, uh, taking on some of the water and allowing, uh, you know, a little higher conditions up to regulation schedule in the refuge. So I just wanted everyone to kind of remember that when we start looking at high stages uh, versus kind of your, your monthly geomatic mean. Um, so I guess what I'm trying to say is I think we should be somewhat careful when we start correlating high stages with the high monthly geometric mean. Because you can see throughout the graphic that sometimes the stages are coming down, but the geometric mean is actually going up. Uh, some places the stages are going up and it's actually going down. So, you know, I just want us to be careful when we say, hey, when stages go up, it's automatic that uh, the geometric mean is going to go up as well. Um, there's a lot of occasions that I've looked at where that is just not the case. So anyway, I just wanted to add those two cents. Thanks. Thank you. That's great. Thank you, Lori. Anybody else on this particular presentation? I am not seeing anyone unmute themselves. So thank you very much. Uh, our next Presentation is also from John Madden. He wants to give us an update on uh, compliance equations and incorporation of the S-333 North structure.
No, Ken, we're not going to make you go early. <laughs> Come on now. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> I know you're ready. <laughs> if we find the presentation. While well, Lissette brings that up, I can introduce um the purpose of having this presentation in my mind i was just trying to think of a way to get to the eventual point where we uh inc start incorporating 333 north into our tracking and and eventual compliance results and that structure um is basically complete there are a few checklist items left uh, prior before the structure will actually be certified uh, but that's kind of a almost a, a paperwork process at the but an important one but the structure is capable of flowing and in fact during the high water conditions um, in from mid-november to mid-december the the gates were cracked just about 0.3 feet 0.2 0.3 feet uh allowing 80 cfs or so through just that was mainly a protection of the structural integrity of it make sure the water levels didn't get too high in that immediate area um for the structure and also it's my understanding that the gates are starting to be operated again and may have opened yesterday. Lissette, are you looking for that presentation? Or you need yeah, you need to throw a copy up. I think I have it here. Well, you don't usually let me do screen sharing. Um, no, I, I can do it. I can do it. Um, um, no, why don't you? Um, yeah, maybe cool. some internet issues or something. That'd be great. Thank you. Okay. promise I can. Oh. There we go. Thank you. Okay. How's that look? Are you seeing That's the full great. slide? That's great. Thank you. Okay, I probably got more slides here than I need, but uh, I just wanted to kind of make a, a complete package, even though some of these things have been presented before uh, in my previous. So we're, I'm trying to communicate out what we might consider for a fairly simple uh, structural addition is this 333N. It's um, basically working in tandem with the 333 as a gated spillway moving water from the L67A and I guess the, the L29 West uh, as well into the L29 East and the headwaters of Shark River Slough for delivery to, to the park. Um, so the functionality is the same as 333. It's 
we since our last meeting we did receive a permit for that modified operation that will be consistent with COP, the combined operating plan, um, and and used in conjunction to um, with the Tamiami Trail flow formula, you know, consistent with all the constraints and considerations that that are built in a COP in that public process for that um, operation or operational plan. So another view that we've seen, and this is looking from the downstream of those two structures back up into um, conservation area 3A with uh, hovering over the, the L29 and, and seeing the L67A go to the right and north and, and to the west and left is the L29 west. So basically these are moving the water from and to similar water bodies. The monitoring we saw last quarter platform upstream of 333N here. This is typical for a uh, distance. It may look a little far, but that's a uh, typical orientation for a platform. We do our grab sampling from that. And we have the gated structure that we're standing on on the right here, looking north. So if we were to treat this just like 333, um, I did include a, a handout that has basically this information plus a little text description, uh, similar we did when we adopted method 1.5. The idea here is to, to communicate this information out, allow for any discussion now or for um, the representatives to take this information get together with their technical folks and be able to come back in the near future for some decision making, whether we need to consider anything different or if, if this is the path forward. So we have two components basically to the compliance methodology, one being the long-term limit. So we're using uh, all the flows that go into Shark River Slough or 3333. This, is, this does not separate out or uh, reduce those flows by 334. So it's consistent with what's currently going on. Basically, anywhere you see 333, we're adding 333N. And 333N is going to have its own flow measurement and its own phosphorus measurement. So those will be two independent um, independent uh, measurements. The flow volume for the flow weighted mean concentrations does subtract out 333. So this is um, all the S12s, which are directly going into Shark River Slough from Conservation Area 3A. And then the rest of these terms here are the method 1.5 that we're currently using uh, going into the L29 headwaters to Northeast Shark River Slough. We would simply add in 333N. And then we would use 333N's phosphorus measurement with its flow. And then there's a, an adjustment for all these to, to um, only use the fraction that is actually going to Shark River Slough. So it's, it's subtracting out 334. So again, all this text that's not bold is the, the current equation. We're just adding in this one line here with 333N phosphorus and flow to, to account for any um, effect that that inflow has on the overall flow weight mean for each event. So again, just restating my intent that hopefully um, this provides information to have that those technical discussions and if there are other ideas um, to bring those forward. And we could have some dialogue now or 
at a future meeting after folks have a chance to digest a little bit more. That's the end. Do I, do I have any questions? Hey, John, this is Frank with DEP. Go ahead, yes. Frank. Yeah, thank you, Julie. Uh, just want to say first and foremost, uh, congratulations in getting to this phase of the 333. And I know this is a long time coming and you guys have been very aggressive with the construction of this project and moving this forward. So congratulations to the district on that project. <clears throat> More of a, on slide six here. Can you go back real quick? Maybe I missed something. The first formula, the flow applied, are we missing the 333? I mean, the 334 from that first equation? Or, or am I seeing something different there? The 334 is not part of that equation and that is historically how the calculation is done okay i just want yeah that makes sense so there were decisions yeah years ago that that um based on those total inflows and not considering the operation of whether it does or doesn't go to shark river slough gotcha thank you for the clarification yeah and i and i agree with your your original statement that this uh, out of all the sub teams that we went through of looking at the inclusion of 356 or the non inclusion of 356, I don't think that's necessary for this situation. I think this should be a fairly straightforward uh, implementation to the equation. So um, that's where I'll leave it. Thank you. Thanks. Thank you, Frank. Any other comments or questions, Dan? I see you are unmuted. Yeah, uh, John, this is Dan Crawford. I guess I just would advocate that on that final row that we be very clear on how that total flow is calculated. Um, I think your intent is to, that total flow to L29 is the same as the volume being used for the flow mate weighted mean concentration, correct? Um, yeah, so... Actually, I, 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 don't want to that. I don't want to introduce a new variable that we're not defining. And at, looking back on the August presentation for method 1.5, um, it looks like that's how we had it. We had it spelled out all the terms in that presentation. Absolutely. Okay. Yeah, I, I abbreviated that for the presentation. It is on the handout. So when we come back, I can... Um, probably a good idea just to spell it all out on the presentation as well i'll find a way yeah, or, or, a note or, or just yeah well just just to be consistent i appreciate thank you for confirming that on the handout and and personally from the chorus perspective i agree with frank um i think the the picture shows enough that this is essentially just a six a sister structure to 333 and i think applying the exact same methodology to this structure makes makes absolute sense I don't think we need a prolonged deliberation on it. Over. Great. Thank you, Dan. Hey, um, John, just this is Frank again. Just one more clarification. And just for my understanding, when talking with my team over here at the department, both the 330, the 333 will remain um, independent of the 333N. What I mean by that is they will both have their own monitoring structures associated with them from a water quality perspective, is that accurate? Yes, yeah. sir. No, yeah. no proposal to uh, eliminate the 333 monitoring at this point in time. We're looking at monitoring both for water quality independently. So we'll maintain the 333 monitoring location that currently is, and there'll be one phosphorus data set associated with that and a uh, new uh, set of data for 333 and will be added. Excellent. Uh, thank you for the clarification. Yeah, yeah, Frank, thanks for asking that question because I was also under, well, I was under the impression that there was going to be a two year side by side collection. So it's really good to hear that we'll be continuing on with 333 um, going forward. So thanks for that additional clarification, John. And, and like Dan and both Frank said, I agree. Um, the 333 North is very similar to the 333. It seems like we should be able to just fold it in in the same manner that we've done with the rest of the structures. 
over. Thank you. Yes, and not to say that I haven't considered one monitoring point for these sites, but with all that's going on right now and, and it hasn't even been operated yet. So I, I think this is not the time to, to try to make any changes there. I think it's smart if we monitor both and see what's actually happening in that location. Any other questions? I'm seeing everyone still on mute, so I think we're good. Thank you, John, and uh, the others of you for weighing in. Uh, we appreciate that. Thanks a lot. So I guess we're going to have to see here. Uh, Lisette, are you back up and able to communicate and drive, or do you need assistance? Yeah, her computer froze, so I don't know if she... Um, Maybe needs help still. I'm not clear on that. <laughs> okay. I think if you've got if you've got Ken's or somebody else has Ken's presentation, let's go ahead and bring that up because. Um, yeah. Uh, I know we're having warmer weather at the moment, but Lisette's computer froze. That's all I can say. <laughs> Okay, Lisette, so we're, we're, I finished this presentation. So if you wanna instead open up the presentation from Ken Bradshaw, then we can move forward. Thanks. Looks like she's back up and running. Hey, this is Donato again. I, um... It was pointed out that there might have been a comment that the 333 North hasn't been used. It was brought to my attention earlier that it has started operation as of last night and is present flowing at around 140 CFS. That's great. Thank you for that. Okay, who else has Ken's presentation? I have it, Julie. I can just up share it um why don't you go ahead and do that i think uh on lisette's computer she has trouble there's an issue with multiple powerpoints so she just went from one to another one probably and froze again <clears throat> thank you okay can you see the powerpoint We'll yeah. see your notes slide, Ken. How about now? Perfect. All right. All right. So let me introduce Ken Bradshaw from the core. He's going to give us an update on the monitoring associated with Step South Contract One. So we're excited this project is going forward. Go ahead, Ken. Thanks, Julie. Um, so at the last TOC meeting, um, John and I kind of gave a tag team presentation on 333 and Sub-South Contract 1. And uh, we've since, uh, I guess, refined some of the uh, Contract 1 monitoring. And we wanted to just give a brief update. I only have like six slides to go through uh, just to, to have everybody um, up to speed on where we're at. So, um, and, and this is going to be really on the, the 67A culverts and the 67C gap contract one monitoring and then the temporary pumps that we discussed in the, in the last quarterly meeting. And just to kind of refresh everyone, um, SEP South is, is composed of a number of different contracts. Um, contract one is for three structures in the L67A and some uh, backfilling and degrading of uh, the Ag Ditch L67C, a, a slight gap, and then there's uh, an opportunity for temporary pumps until uh, a later contract for contract five that removes the L29 levy. And contract one was awarded in October. And so we have uh, the three um, structures and a marsh site, and then the, t the temporary pumps as part of our compliance monitoring plan. Um, between the, the last quarterly meeting and now, 
We've refined the locations of the where we expect the temporary pumps to go, as well as um, we're in the process of refining the location for the CA3 BS marsh station that you see kind of in the middle of the Blue Shanty Flowway. Um, really, uh, we, we are just trying to finalize the compliance monitoring plan and we'll get that submitted to uh, FDEP for approval, hopefully by the end of this month. Um, in our last meeting, we talked about having the temporary, or, or I guess getting the temporary pumps installed uh, kind of early on in, in the 2021 year. And right now I think it'll be a little bit later in 2021, possibly early 2022 before the temporary pumps are installed. And that's really kind of the, I guess the point that we wanted to get um, out on the table here, because that would uh, mean that we need to start tracking the, you know, compliance for uh, flows and in, in phosphorus one in the Shark River Slough. Uh, we thought it was going to be a little earlier, and now looking at construction schedules and contracting schedules, um, it's looking like it's going to be uh, at least later in the year, possibly next year. And just uh, as a reminder, these are the uh, sampling parameters we're looking at at the different structures. Um, the contractor is going to construct uh, the 633 structure, uh, the ag ditch backfill, and the levy degrade first, followed by 632 and then 631. At least that's that's the understanding we have right now. Um, and so we're going to we would start monitoring those structures and the temporary pumps as they are installed. And then the CA3 BS, which is the Blue Shanty Marsh Station, uh, we're planning to go ahead and begin monitoring that um, as soon as we can get a contract in place this year. Uh, it's looking like it'll probably be early summer and it's just a monthly grab uh, out in the marsh. There's, there's no physical platform or anything that's planned at this time. Uh, we just go out in, in an airboat or a helicopter and take a, a monthly grab sample at that station. And uh, that's that's for uh, total phosphorus and uh, the DOPH conductivity and temperature parameters that you see here in the table. So really, that's the update that I had. I just wanted to uh, kind of give everybody a, an update on on what our plans are for sampling and compliance monitoring coming up this uh, most I guess this water year and this year and moving forward with uh, implementation of the contract one for SEP South. And uh, this is the this is a picture of where the S632 is going, uh, looking west across the the L67A canal, uh, kind of looking into WCA3A. So with that, I'll take any questions. Thank you, Ken. Uh, we really appreciate the update. Does anybody have any comments or questions for Ken? I am not seeing anybody unmute or raise their hand at this time. So thanks a lot, Ken. That's really great. We appreciate it. Um, <clears throat> now we're going to go into the public comment uh, part of our meeting. So again, if you are a member of the public attending, please raise your hand. You'll need to use star six or whatever other unmuting capability you have. Um, and hopefully I will be able to catch your raised hand. I, I think I'm on the right screen for that. If anybody has public comment, we would love to hear from you now. I'll give folks a moment or so to raise their hand if, if they so desire. I'm not seeing anything at the moment. You said Julie star nine, if you're on the phone, raises your hand. Uh, yes, thank you, John, for reminding us because I have an actual mute button on my phone here at my house. <laughs> uh, we'll give it one more minute. I'm not seeing anything yet. Um, I, I do want to express to all of you, there's about 30 folks who are dialed in as uh, meeting attendees. We might get to see your faces in the auditorium sometime this year, I hope, but uh, at the moment we're not doing that. So, all right, I guess we don't have any public comment. Um, any closing remarks from TOC reps? Frank? 
Hey, Julie. Uh, thank you, ma'am. I appreciate it. I just want to let the team know that um, it's been a pleasure serving with you guys for the last eight years. I, it's hard to imagine it's been eight years working with this family, with the TOC members. I have taken an opportunity to join the Northwest Florida Water Management District effective in February. And I just want to say thank you guys for the education, the knowledge, the professionalism that this board uh, this committee has served and and just the enlightenment that I've been able to provide uh, throughout this entire time. And it's been a pleasure working with you guys. So thank you, Julie, for the opportunity. Well, thank you, Frank. Uh, it's been really great working with you. And I can't believe it's been eight years either. That, mm -hmm. that means some of us have some bigger number that we associate with this group. But uh, thank you so much for your service over the years. And we'll look forward to hearing uh, who your replacement will be. Yes, ma'am. Thank you. Okay. Uh, any other closing comments? I have a couple of uh, items. Uh, John was going to look at maybe uh, adding a line on the 328 to one of the slides, but I don't really have a lot of big action items here. Uh, okay. Uh, last but not least, we get to schedule a next meeting. And again, Violetta usually chooses these dates based on the availability of the auditorium, whether we will use it or not, I, I can't predict at the moment. You'll have to ask uh, COVID-19 what they're going to be doing. Uh, but do you guys have any preferences over um, for a next quarterly meeting, uh, May 18th or June 1st? And I'm available both of those days. Lori? This is Lori with The Refuge. Um, man, you know, looking that far out in the future, those, I'm not sure either one's going to be great for me, but I'll, I'll try to make them work. I think if I have to, to play the odds, I think I'm, I would rather try to shoot for maybe June 1st. I know that's the day after... Uh, Memorial Day, I do believe. Um, yes, yes. But to play it safe, um, I, I think maybe June first will, will be would be better for me. Okay, great, thank you, Mr. Barkat. Oh, uh, that day's fine for me. All right, so let's see, Dan. The June first works perfect for me. I'm also fine with the 18th. Okay, great. Thank you so much. And then, uh, Donato, what about you? All of the above work for me. All right, great. So we'll target June 1st. It sounds like um, that would be probably the easiest or best for the most. And uh, looking forward to hearing you all then. <laughs> all right. I, I, would, think I wouldn't note that's more than three months from now. Right, right. Uh, maybe Violetta could let us know. You know, you're right, and I didn't actually notice that, but it may be that we don't have availability before then. Well, I, I don't think COVID is going to allow us to meet in person in the next, in March or April. So if, if we're going to do this remotely, we should have more flexibility, and maybe we could schedule something in April as opposed to June. Um, and you know what, that would be all right with me. I'll tell you what, if it's okay with all of you, uh, we'll look for some alternate dates that are a little closer to the three month point and uh, coordinate that date by email. Is that all right with everybody? But the issue is that the GEAR conference is happening on April the 20th, or we got placeholders for the 20th and the 27th. So I think that's why we probably got pushed out into May. Okay. All right. Well, I'll tell you what, I think you guys all have a good point here. We'll, we'll look around on the calendars again. And um, unfortunately, I do kind of agree with you, Mr. Barquette. I'm not sure we're going to be meeting in person in three months anyway. So uh, we'll, we'll schedule it for the 1st of June tentatively and look for an earlier date. I think that would be the best for now. So uh, all right. Great. Hey, Julie, this, this is Lori with The Refuge. Yeah, I think that would probably be really better for me if we could could get that in April or maybe earlier in May. So that would be helpful. Maybe probably more like 
April. <laughs> yeah. Well, I do recall, and since Mr. Barquette brought this up, you know, a lot of times we have a meeting in late April, but um, we need to be mindful of the GEAR conference, which is also a very important uh, scientific endeavor. So let's see what we can do to work around that. And if we can find even a date earlier in May, then we'll get that out to you guys and get concurrence. And then we'll, uh, we'll put the new date on the TOC webpage and we will uh, get it on the uh, public meetings page for folks. It, it, just so you know, if it works, May, May 4th would be fine for me, so. Okay, thank you. This is Lori, that looks great for me as well. Dan, Donato, and others, do you guys want to weigh in on that right now? Okay. And we're assuming it'll be a Zoom or, I think we're getting used to Zoom. I don't want to switch to another technology, but uh, does, how does May 4th look for the others of you? It works for Donato. It works for Dan. I don't think I'm going anywhere in May, but let me look real quick. Oh, it works for Julie. Okay. So let's plan on May 4th, and if uh, there's some glitch that we're not aware of right now, we could, uh, again, loop back around with you guys. How's that? All right? Very good. Thank you, Julie. All right. Thanks Thank a lot, everybody. Have a great day. You. Thanks for your participation today. Yeah, stay safe, everybody, please. Yes, thank you. See you.